very pleased to introduce Will to give the closing talk on what's been a, an incredibly interesting, informative, and deeply enjoyable weekend. So please join me for one last time in welcoming Will. Hello again. Um, thanks for making it all the way through. Um, I hope you had as much fun during this conference as I did. Um, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about some of my highlights. I don't know if losing 100 pounds a minute ago was a highlight or a low light. <laughs> it was certainly something. Um, very unexpected. Um, so yeah, this has been actually, like, completely honestly, um, my favorite EAG in ages and ages. I thought the quality of, like, conversations that were happening, uh, quality of the talks, um, just everything going on was just, like, yeah, super interesting from my perspective. Uh, so I met a bunch of um, really interesting people. Um, one of my favorite conversations was getting, giving career advice to an undergraduate um, who is, also happens to be one of the most famous magicians in India and is so, <laughs> therefore has to decide whether to become a magician on EA grounds or not. Um, <laughs> which really was not a career um, query that I'd actually heard before. Um, I didn't know the answer. Um, uh, other highlights, um, definitely big shout out to Kelly Leiker of Effective Giving in the Netherlands as well. Um, maybe not like as well known as they ought to be in the EA community, but um, promoting effective philanthropy among uh, high net worths in uh, the Netherlands and getting interested in impact investing as well. And they've, seems to me, been having a, a really huge impact. Um, seemed to me like the talks were just super interesting as well, those that I could go to. Um, it was great uh, being able to see Joe um, who's up there looking very philosophical, um, uh, giving, you know, coming at EA from a non-consequentialist perspective um, and actually just arguing for the kind of multitude of reasons why you might care about um, reducing extinction risk. Um, also, it's so nice for me seeing Owen and Tara talking about um, Fermi estimates and back-of-the-envelope calculations showing that, you know, even people I know very well, I can learn a lot from. Uh, I said, you know, the aim for you all should be trying to learn to change your mind. So uh, in my own case, you know, I, at least one update was just uh, in the course of Sam Bankman-Fried's talk, um, asking the audience about how much they expected different organizations to be willing to pay to get a new employee. Um, I actually expected people to get this really badly wrong, um, but uh, actually people were like way more accurate than I expected. And so that suggests that maybe um, some of the kind of messaging that we've been doing around you know, backing off the earning to give as much as we had been in the past. Um, I guess it's actually, you know, people have actually been updating on that. Um, but I'm now gonna give you all the opportunity to turn to the person next to you and uh, say one thing, one way in which you've changed your mind or at least an argument that's like really given you pause, something of that form um, that you've experienced over the course of the conference. I'll give you maybe like two minutes to do that. It's always really painful when I get people to do that, because like as soon as I get someone, to, people to turn to their partner, to turn to the person next to them, like the kind of buzz is really very tangible. It's um, really nice to see. Um, okay, well I hope you're able to discuss like just some of the ways that uh, you've kind of updated, changed your mind, changed your mind in a variety of ways. Um, this kind of ties to I think that kind of I'm going to talk about two issues um, at the moment in terms of EA, and the first is like related to this idea of exploration, and it's the idea of just also related to the theme of kind of doing good together and thinking about impact as a community, which is the aim of kind of fostering a community and a culture that's you know, just very open-minded, actually capable of changing its mind, where um, it's you know, an obvious way in which EA can fail that just ossifies into certain, group, certain beliefs, there's certain things you just have to believe to be you know, part of the effective altruism community. We kind of agree that would be very bad. But yeah, I think it's extremely hard to create a culture in which that's not the case. You know, I think humans are designed to be overconfident. They're designed to um, get evidence that confer, like, interpret evidence in ways that confirms their belief rather than dispels them. Um, and above all, uh, you know, adapted to try and form little tribes based around kind of group beliefs rather than um, having an identity that means you can really change those beliefs. And so I'm going to, you know, just. I don't really have like that many concrete suggestions. I'm gonna just kind of open this as an important question and thing that we should be thinking about and kind of what that really entails. And in particular, I emphasize the importance of kind of keeping EA weird, endorsing kind of EA ideas. And I think it's really important to think 
well, actually, what, how can we act such that we do are as open as possible to weird ideas? What does that, exactly does that mean? Because in particular, I think one thing it doesn't mean, but a way you might be tempted to interpret it, is presenting any idea in the most contrarian way possible. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to suggest that like, any, there's, you know, some people do this more than others. But, but some people clearly really enjoy being contrarians. Um, and you know, what we want, though, but that's a cost. So like, we're really pro-weirdness, but weirdness of an idea is a cost. But, you know, it's a reason against thinking it's true. And it can have you know, really substantial costs. Like the early discussion about the importance of this extinction risk, you know, a lot of it was focused on this one argument of like, well, no matter how small the probability, the vastness of the future means that it's therefore overwhelmingly important to be the, you know, over overwhelming importance. Um, and it was only later that people started to you know, point out that actually there's very many different arguments um, in favor of this as an er um, as a extremely important cause area. Multiple arguments for thinking that this is very important. And um, uh, you know, that just should increase the credence that we give to it. And that wouldn't be open to us if we were just trying to be contrarian. Um, also means that when we kind of interact as well, we need to treat other people as kind of humans rather than everyone being a utility maximizing robot um, who will only hear the literal meanings of what you say rather than the context. Um, I mean, I think the important thing to bear in mind is just that um, you know, if you're online and kind of write a comment, for example, the amount of time spent reading that comment is probably going to be much longer than the amount of time you kind of spend writing it. So it's actually like really worth thinking about, well, not just kind of what's the literal meaning of the things that I, of the thing I'm saying, but like how might people misinterpret this? You know, how might, um, uh, you know, how might it potentially like alienate people that you're talking to? Um, so, Another kind of way in which I think this can be misinterpreted is weird just means weirder compared to kind of common sense. Um, this is, uh, you know, in the same way as you might think in communist Russia, you can um, uh, criticize Stalin, but only because he's not Stalinist enough. Um, that's not real kind of debate. And similarly, if uh, EA again becomes, you know, the better ideas, the real kind of thinkers are the only those who defend the ideas that are even further than the mainstream than we currently think. That's again another failure mode. And so, um, you know, there's plenty of ideas that are commonly accepted in EA, but weird um, from the perspective of uh, the rest of so society or kind of common sense. Um, and maybe we're kind of wrong about them too. Maybe common sense is actually right. Or maybe things that aren't so common sense, but definitely not common within EA. Um, maybe there's things we can learn there. Um, and so if someone's, you know, coming along espousing, I don't know, Marxist ideas, for example, um, the right approach isn't to kind of shut that down um, immediately. It's to, like, figure out, well, is there actually an insight here that, um, you know, we could really benefit from? Um, then, yeah, I think above all it means, um, you know, being careful about, like, how we phrase conversations, um, how we kind of communicate ideas. That's kind of overall idea. Um, uh, kind of overall theme of these like different ways in which we can interpret the like the aim of contributing to intellectual progress um, in the right way, um, and so here are just like some suggestions in terms of what concretely this might mean. Like one is just like having kind of high standards for again how we phrase things. Where again, where I mean, I'm especially thinking of online forums. There's different um, scenarios where you've got greater or lesser degree of um, uh, risk of being kind of misunderstood, alienating people you're talking to, um, where I think like just a bit of like having some amount of effort in terms of ensuring that we're phrasing things really well, avoiding misunderstandings, avoiding unnecessary jargon, which is again another easy way in which um, you know communities can start to become more insular, and also just being really charitable with the uh, you know people we're interacting with as well. So. Um, you know, ensuring that you're giving people the benefit of the doubt rather than um, interpreting them in a way that seems dumb and then um, criticizing that view. Um, and then in general, I think, just being willing to be open to like a wide kind of diversity of perspectives and really expecting that you're going to bump into a bunch of people who have, you know, very different views from you um, and taking that kind of um, uh, as granted and being kind of open and accepting to that rather than feeling like you've got to shoot them down. 
Um, I mean, a kind of broader thing, I'm like really not sure about this, but like in terms of fostering an intellectual community, um, social media just looks really bad from this perspective. Um, so I often think, you know, people often say that uh, the pursuit, you know, Effective altruism is for the pursuit of good, what the scientific revolution is for the pursuit of truth. At least that's what we're aiming to do. And then, you know, I sometimes imagine what if the kind of early promoters of the scientific method were on Facebook and Twitter. And so, yeah, Francis Bacon was trying to, like, explain experiment, the experimental method on Twitter. Um, and was just getting 100 responses all calling him a cuck. Um, <laughs> it's like... Um, it's going to be really, yeah, it's going to be like really hard to do that in an effective way. I mean, these, you know, platforms are des not designed to help people collaborate in an intellectual way. They're designed to, um, I mean, often to foster drama. They're designed to get you to keep kind of clicking on them. Um, and so then, I guess a shout out here to uh, Ben Pace and Oliver Habaker, who've been, you know, trying to solve this problem directly by trying to creating lesser wrong. But you know, the idea being a, a better online platform that can actually foster kind of high quality discussion. But certainly like the EA forum is meant to be designed kind of more around this as well. Um, and then I think the final thing and what I'll talk about in the rest of this um, talk is just emphasizing kind of how little we know. Where if we do think, you know, if we do have these lofty aims of um, EA being, you know, aspiring to be like the scientific revolution but with the pursuit of good, we should bear in mind that well, we're kind of like in the med medieval ages then with how much we know. We should bear in mind that there's this huge amount of uncharted territory. And so the final um, uh, half of this talk, I'm gonna just talk about some of the things that you know, really weigh on my mind at least, things that I think are just totally unresolved and could really have a big impact on how we think about things. So you know, one in term, you know, we have made a bunch of progress. That's definitely something we should feel happy about. You know, the idea that distribution of effectiveness among causes and within a cause are heavy-tailed. Um, that's actually just this, like, huge insight and kind of forms the basis of a lot of um, our views and, in many ways, the whole EA project. That's why it's so important to figure out not just what has an impact, but what does the most good. Um, you know, and another example is the understanding of replaceability within career choice. We moved far beyond the kind of naive conception we had back in 2010. Um, and you know, ultimately actually deciding it's perhaps just not that important an idea, at least in many cases. Um, and the cases for the kind of uh, typical cause areas, global health, farm animal welfare, existential risk, we feel like we now know pretty well what, like, why these are such priority causes. But there is still a bunch we don't know. So here are just some examples. So one is how we take into account long run effects, where often when you know, people talk about donating to Give directly or AMF. The focus is on the short run effect. So distribute bed nets, and um, in doing so, you know, you prevent some amount of malaria, save a child's life. But it has this vast number of indirect effects. Um, some are negative. Doing so will increase meat, meat, increase meat consumption, will increase greenhouse gas emissions. Many are positive. So people innovate, people build infrastructure. Um, and many, it's just unclear what that means, but. You know, you save lives, those people will go on to have children who themselves will have children. And you create this whole set of ripple effects for, um, you know, potentially forever. And something that just really hasn't been explored, it hasn't been explored by economists, not really, um, hasn't been fully explored by people in EA is just how big a deal are these, how morally relevant. Maybe that's a crucial consideration with respect to the sorts of charities we currently recommend. A different way in which you could um, kind of debate the, some of the uh, top kind of global poverty charities that we recommend are, you know, in terms of just improving um, political institutions. Um, I think especially within developing world, but also at the international or domestic level. Um, you know, there just are many economists that still make this case, that make the case that um, because the gains are so great from, uh, for example, you know, making it easier just to do business in India, let's say, um, Pushing on that as a lever is just going to be much greater in terms of expected value, um, even than the very large amount of good which is taken as given from distributing bed nets. Um, and maybe it is a gap that, you know, Open Philanthropy Project within other cause areas focused on kind of hits-based giving, but there's maybe still a gap within hits-based giving with respect to improving the lives of the global poor. In other cause areas as well, I think, you know, 
even more model uncertainty. Um, so, you know, how we assign model status, so degree, amount of model weight to different non-human animals, how much can they uh, suffer or uh, benefit. Um, you know, some people talk about brain size between um, chickens and mammals. Um, uh, doesn't seem like that's a very good proxy at all. What can we do that's better? Um, seems like very difficult um, question, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps just completely intractable, but very important if we can answer this. Um, kind of relatedly, where there's the zero level for welfare, we often talk about creatures that have lives not worth living. So where most people think that you know, um, factory farm chicken just has a life so bad that it would be better if it had never been born. But where is that zero level? What's the point at which an animal has a you know, good life or a bad life? Um, how does that apply to wild animals? You know, um, at what point do people have lives that um, aren't worth living as well? Again, sort of like in between empirical philosophical question that academic literature seems to have not really touched, but again, kind of crucial to what we want to do. Then within kind of animal welfare and other whole areas, what concrete promising interventions there are with respect to wild animal suffering. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about um, uh, the importance of this, but something I think just we don't really have a good understanding of is, okay, even assuming you're really pursuing that cause area, what are the things that you could do to really make big progress on it? Within the realm of kind of long run future, um, or, um, oriented work, probably even more questions again. So one is just the, you know, how robust is this case? We've already, I think, from people like Joe, just doing work in terms of thinking, well, how many different model perspectives actually support this? Um, how sensitive is this argument to um, population ethics? If you only care about people alive today, is there still a case of reducing extinction risk? Just because actually the probability of um, an existential uh, level risk is large enough that reducing that risk is good for people today. Um, I actually think that's more compelling than um, you, know, uh, you might have thought, given the way the arguments are often, um, often framed. And then like, looking at just that kind of very long run argument, um, if you think, wow, it's so important to produce a very large finite amount of value, this is now really going in the weirder direction. Why not to produce an infinite amount of value? And is there like a good genuinely good philosophical response to that? Um, that argument or counter argument. Um, second whole approach kind of within this is about kind of reducing extinction risk versus increasing the value of the future conditional on us not going extinct. Um, you know, the uh, future, um, you, you know, those in Germany have been uh, working on this question, worrying about very, very bad outcomes. But the same is true for kind of very good outcomes as well. Um, even if we manage to navigate the next few centuries, that doesn't mean we necessarily achieve the best outcome for civilization. There's potentially a very large range in how well things could go or how badly things could go. And maybe the best thing to do is to increase the chance of the good outcomes rather than the bad outcomes, rather than just increasing the chance of there being a civilization at all. Final category then, now kind of relevant to what I'm talking about now, is like what are the implications of model uncertainty? You know, I'm hoping everyone feels kind of some degree of conflict about you know, many of these issues and the areas they're focusing on. Um, what are the implications? Like, does the fact that some model views say just things are so overwhelmingly important, does that mean that um, you know, we sh even if you've got low credence in those views, you should still kind of act um, in accordance with them? Or is that, you know, um, is something long, long gone wrong with your decision theory if that's the case? Um, separate question is whether we should diversify you know, among different worldviews. So um, Ajay uh, uh, talked a little bit about this just earlier today, and it's you know, one of the things on open philanthropy's mind is, should they just say, yep, there's the best cause area, that one's the best, I'm going to focus all our resources on that? Should we as a community think that as well? Or is it um, better to spread our resources among many different areas? Again, there's just, this is work that we really don't know about yet. Does the option value argument for reducing extinction risk work? Like, can we just punt all of these difficult model questions and say, well, okay, what we want to do is ensure that people are still around in the future and you know, rational and morally reflective, and then they can work out all of these hard questions that we don't already know. Final kind of set of questions I'll discuss is then just on this question of kind of global priorities research and 
the question of cause selection. Where, you know, we've kind of um, anchored at the moment in these three, you know, three primary cause areas, though obviously people are open to others, but, um, you know, it's quite, quite plausible that there are things that we've really missed. Um, similarly, perhaps, like the framework that we're using, scale, neglect, and distractibility, um, I think there's, you know, plenty of good work. These are all just heuristics. No one's kind of pretended that they're anything more than that. And, but maybe they're systematically leading us astray in some ways. Um, kind of the related question is then thinking about distribution of effectiveness within interventions, within a cause compared to across causes, where if it's the case that the distributions are just really, really big in both cases, then perhaps actually we really should spread across many different causes, just picking the best things from each of them, rather than having this approach of kind of cause first and then second, um, you know, after working out what the highest priority cause is, working on what the best thing is um, within that. Perhaps instead it means we should have a much broader approach. Um, similarly, I mean, something I'm really wondering about as well is if you just got this perspective of saying, well, most people throughout most of history have got kind of moral issues really badly wrong and not even seen how they've got it really badly wrong. Similarly, most people throughout history, if they've tried to predict the future, have got it cartoonishly wrong. Um, sadly, I didn't you know, fly here on my jetpack, and then I'm not going to um, uh, go home in a flying car. But those are often what the predictions that people make. And given that, if we're trying to like, predict the future, we should think with a kind of, and trying to do moral progress, we should think within a similar position. But if, that, if so, what are the kind of very safe things we could do, things that might look good across a wide array of different possible futures and a different possible moral perspectives. Um, perhaps that's you know, improving institutions, reducing the ch chance of war and so on. And then finally, what might cause X be? What might be that cause that is actually of overwhelming importance or you know, even more important than the things we currently know of that we haven't even kind of conceptualized yet or have maybe dismissed for um, quite unfair reasons? So this kind of whole um, approach I call global priorities research. Um, and, you know, we can think about global priorities of the search, you know, in its own time. Like, how important is it for us to do that? And how is it important is it for us to do this research? And when it comes to, like, prioritizing, like, big kind of questions, it's often hard. We don't really have intuitions. But we can have intuitions about just very simple cases of kind of decision-making we make. Like, supposing you're going to a restaurant, and you'll spend, like, a couple of hours at the restaurant how long do you spend in order to work out kind of what restaurant to go to? Um, you know, maybe reflecting on your own preferences, looking up reviews and so on. It's probably five minutes or so typically, unless it's, you're going to somewhere you've been before. And that seems kind of reasonable. It seems reasonable to spend kind of 5% of your time deciding how to spend the remaining 95%. But then maybe we can think about that si same kind of framework with respect to the whole world, jumping up in scale quite a bit, where we think, well, as a kind of global civilization, you know, how much resources do we, how many resources do we actually spend trying to figure out, well, how should we be using the rest of our resources? Where's humanity actually going? Um, and I think it's just absolutely nothing like that sort of amount. I mean, very hard to even think about how you put figures on this, but, you know, one thing I thought about was just, well, look at the, you know, annual spending of the UK government. It's about 770 billion. And then supposing we just think all humanities all spending on humanities and social sciences are all designed to kind of answer that question. So that's like very generous um, understanding of what the humanities and social sciences are doing. But assume that all of that funding is designed uh, to help us address this question of where is you know, the human race going? How actually ought we to be using the resources we have? Well, that would amount to about 0.04% <laughs> um, of that expenditure, um, which you know, from this perspective of just thinking, well, you know, we have these vast resources, we're spending basically no time at all thinking about how we ought to spend them. So I think using its own framework, global priorities research looks really important. <laughs> it looks important, it looks neglected, and, um, you know, potentially tractable as well. Um, but then, as well as just the sheer importance of kind of doing this work and doing this thinking, which is just, you know, the core of what effective altruism is about, I just think it's actually an incredibly exciting intellectual project on its own terms. Um, it's you know, very unusual that 
we um, can have kind of so many open questions all being driven by um, this kind of overarching question of asking, well, how can we use our resources to do the most good? And because so few people have tried to address so many of these questions, there's just incredibly little um, research being done on so many of them. And it means I think there's an incredible amount of low-hanging fruit um, still out there. And so, you know, even if we put aside the hopeful large impact that this will have, um, I think simply in intellectual terms, it's, um, you know, an extremely exciting place uh, to be. So to kind of finish in quoting Nietzsche somewhat badly, I think with respect to global priorities of the search, there's never been such a clear horizon nor such an open sea. Um, okay, thank you. Time for more chanting. Um, but it's, it's, seriously, it's, it's thank you time. Um, and there are obviously lots of thank yous to be, to be said. So firstly, we're all here because of our um, incredible event producers. So can we give a big hand to Amy LeBenz and Katie Glass, please. Also, um, a massive thank you for everybody else who made this event happen. So CEA staff, my fellow MCs, and all of our wonderful Turquoise volunteers. If you could come up, that would be great. <laughs> Maybe just like here. <laughs> yeah. to a photo op. <laughs> so I guess a quick pause for photo. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and also, um, obviously, this couldn't happen without the incredible and thoughtful speakers. So a massive round of applause for the speakers, please. <laughs> and <laughs> last but very much, <laughs> last but very much, uh, Least but not last, last but not least, it's been a long weekend. Um, a very, very big thank you to all the attendees for making it this wonderful event. And as a thank you, um, go forth and booze. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs>